Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation with artists Caleb Duarte Piñon and Mia E. Rolo on Zapantera Negra and artistic exchanges between Black Panther Party and Zapatista communities. We're really looking forward to the conversation today on art making as a form of resistance and solidarity and the transformative quality of images to support and nurture movements for self-determination. So Interference Archive began in what we now call New York City, but is stolen and occupied lands of the Leni Lenape people, known as Lenape, the Lenape Hoking. We're sharing this land acknowledgement as part of our active and ongoing exploration of our relationship with occupation, settler colonialism, and community. This is a digital living land acknowledgement from Adrian Wong that we are reading today as it relates to our current gathering on the internet. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates and disproportionately affects indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Um, so with that, um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Elena. Um, and my name is Shruti. Um, both Elena and I are volunteers uh, with Interference Archive. Um, and for those of y'all who are new to the space, um, we're a volunteer run OpenStax community archive um, and an exhibition space that explores different social movement cultures and materials. All of our collection is donation based and includes periodicals, posters, zines, buttons, stickers, and some Zapatista boots and so much more. Um, so we're really excited and invite y'all to come down to Park Slope whenever um, during open hours and look at our collection, uh, or you can learn more at our website, which I'll drop in the chat, alongside some instructions for how y'all can access captions for today's can event. See it? Click on oh. Sorry about that. Um, uh, along with how you can access captions as well as rename yourself. Um, so to access captions for this event, there's um, a button in green at the bottom of your screen and two icons to the right of that. The second icon from the right should have two C's in it. And if you press that button, you can enable subtitles, um, which will allow you to see a live transcription of whatever we say. Um, and you can also rename yourself if you would like by going to your icon on the and going to the top right corner of your picture or your name and clicking rename, which will be the bottom most option. And then you can type however you'd like to, to name yourself. All right, back to our introduction. Um, there is our address. We're on 7th Street in Brooklyn um, and we're open Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays um, in the afternoon um, and the early evening. And we recently just wrapped um, our exhibition, Silencio Fuego, Palabra y Vida, Zapatista Graphics from the Archivo Itinerante de Gráfica Zapatista and Interference Archive. Um, which we curated with Iden Bastida Kulik um, and shares work that is part of Iden's collection of Zapatista graphics, um, which you can see folks looking at here on the picture on the right. Um, but uh, the show closed last week, so we're, we're sharing right now um, a few images to give you a better sense of how our archive is organized and a little peek at Iden's collection. Just sharing a few more images while we have the um, slideshow up. Um, oops. Um, so the program also celebrates the publication of a new and expanded, oops, sorry, everyone, a new and expanded um, edition of Zapantera Negra, an artistic encounter between Black Panthers and Zapatistas. Um, a book published by Common Notions um, that celebrates and documents the artistic collaborations. And um, we will share a link in the chat to take a look at the book. I have a copy right next to me. 
um, and Caleb and Mia will um, be speaking about this as well. Right. I'm going to really quickly um, do some housekeeping, some more housekeeping. Um, a heads up that we're recording this call and we're going to be sharing it publicly for educational purposes only. If you prefer that your participation is not recorded, you can message either Elena or I and we'll accordingly accommodate y'all. Um, also, it's important to note that this program is meant to evolve into a conversation and we encourage each of you to chime in and participate by asking questions, sharing comments at the end of the call, either via chat or by raising your hand with the raise hand function. And then another central thing to how Interference Archive gathers is um, acknowledging that when we share a virtual space together like we are today, um, we are also being in an environment that is an extension of the archive's physical space. Um, and so Elena, if Elena's going to share a little list of our community expectations that are a really vital part of our physical space, um, and we're going to bring them into this virtual space together and practice to them, practice them together. Um, again, if you all have any questions, feel free to message Elena or I at any point, um, but let's just take a moment to read this slide. Um, Interference archive community expectations. We insist that everyone who uses this virtual space remains mindful of and takes responsibility for their speech and behavior. This includes always acting out of respect and concern for the free expression, free expression of others, actively listening to others and not dominating discussions, respecting physical and emotional boundaries, and humbling, accepting, respectful correction or correcting yourself, keeping in mind that the impact of your words and actions on other people is more important than your intent. I'm going to pause for a moment so y'all can also read um, and absorb. Does anyone have any questions, any thoughts, comments, any additions they would like to make? All right, Elena, I'm going to pass the mic back to you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so with that, I'm really excited to introduce um, Caleb and Mia, um, who will share their work with us today. Um, Mia Ivrolo is a multidisciplinary artist and Chicago native. She creates nomadic, globally engaged collectives of artistic practice centering her work within the communities where she lives and works in site-specific places of spiritual, social, and cultural resistance. After receiving her graduate degree in 2009, she moved to Chiapas, Mexico, where she co-founded with Caleb uh, Idelo, an experimental art space and international residency, uh, which they'll um, speak a little bit more about um, in a minute. Uh, Mia has spoken about her work at various academic and grassroots venues across the US and Mexico, and her work has been featured in publications and podcasts. Um, she's one of the lead artists in projects such as Zapantera Negra and Embassy of the Refugee. Caleb Duarte Piñon lives and works between San Francisco Bay Area and San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas, Mexico. He creates temporary installations using construction type frameworks such as beds of dirt cement and objects suggesting basic shelter. His installations within institutional settings become sites for performance as interpretations of his community collaborations. Um, Caleb has created public works and community performances internationally and has collaborated with autonomous indigenous Zapatista collectives, communities and movement and working children and families seeking asylum. Caleb has lectured and exhibited his work internationally he is the co-founder with Mia of Videlo and co-curator of the Zapantera Negra project. So thank you so much, Caleb and Mia, for joining us. We're so grateful and honored that you're sharing your work and experiences with us. And with that, I will hand it over to you both. All right. Well, thank you for having us. Um, a quick uh, Correction, we're, we're more like, not facilitators or curators, we're, we're kind of um, in the mix. So, so, so uh, trying to define our role within this larger collaborative work is, is, is kind of difficult within this lens, right? So I think facilitators might, might, might work a little bit better because there was uh, so many of us involved. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I don't know if Mia, you wanna 
jump in on that. Um, yeah, while he's sharing, I'll just um, say, yeah, we're really excited to be here, um, to be a part of the Interference Archives, and we're glad that um, everyone has um, come to see this, and we hope to have a good conversation after we show a little bit of this work. Great. So we'll present a little bit of our personal work, our journey to, towards Chapas. Um, and, and how it's been developing since 2012. Um, Sapantera Negra is, is, is uh, thinking about image, the object, the body and sight um, all together. And I think it, it works with, with the idea of, of, of certain communities with um, very political and economic power that we turn to the surreal, the magical, the poetic, the absurd to challenge the really clear evidence of power and violence and strength that uh, our current economic systems promote. Um, and so um, these are just two very beautiful art movements, um, uh, bigger than art movements. In Mayan Celtal, there's no word for art because art is life. There's no separation from art and life and food and politics. Um, and so there's this um, there's there's this uh, invitation to for artists to think about these two movement in their own within their own spaces within their own political social spaces right and um, that was kind of like the essence of the of of, of the call out. I'm um, going a little bit back. Me and I met in grad school in 2009. We were studying sculpture in the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and uh, at that time I was working with. Um, a lot of unaccompanied um, community members. I myself am, am economically displaced from Northern Mexico. And so uh, my language is also of the vernacular of, of the displaced of, of the body of seeking validation and all that stuff that we're trying to deal with in the current time. And so we were creating these portable um, sanctuaries to claim protection for ourselves, to take power on our own hands, much like the Catholic Church protects undocumented folks through the temporary sanctuary movement in, in Ireland back in the day. Um, we did this work in Honduras with also uh, children uh, making their way north. Um, and of course, food and workshops, these are long-term relationships that are created to think about the poetic of home, of displacement, of joy. Um, here's uh, Mia's with No Pasa Nada. So yeah, I'm gonna um, jump in here and um, basically say, when Caleb and I met, it was a really interesting sort of, um, sort of like explosion of um, investigation. Um, uh, as Caleb said, he was investigating kind of house and sanctuary um, and like how to protect uh, a community through artistic means. Um, and I myself had only six months prior um, had a near death experience and I ended up uh, paraplegic through that experience um, and decided to return to grad school um, you know, half a year, a year later so quickly because I felt this urgency to kind of feed my soul. You know, I had such a such a kind of life changing um, experience and everything around me, um, you know, was was kind of different. All of a sudden in public space, I was a spectacle um, and, or, uh, you know, People who have disabilities were either were either looked at too much or or were invisible, you know, too little. So anyway, um, you know, I started to use my body as the as a as a powerful symbol for resistance and for taking over space. And when we moved to Chiapas, um, we basically started to work with communities um, and you know our bodies together or simply their bodies, their stories. Um, so, you know, talking about femicide, talking about 
colonialism, talking about uh, disabled, the working children, um, you know, uh, people who are asking for money on the street. I mean, just basically using creativity as a as a powerful force within our lives. So within this time, we 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 got out of grad school and then we had to do a whole process of de-learning, uh, the creative process, right? Two years and six years of private art school. Um, moved to Chiapas, really inspired by, by the language, the use of art, and we moved there to, to be of, of service, to be of assistance, to learn and de-learn, right? Of what, what the power of art is, what the power of image is, what the power of language is, like was mentioned earlier today. Um, and so we opened up uh, the, the United Nations offices was occupied in Chiapas by displaced indigenous workers. The United Nations decided to move, left the building empty. Uh, me and I were already looking for an art space to work and making space. And uh, we moved in there, started running the space. And we kept the name where the United Nations used to be. It's in a, a Spanish acronym to kind of um, pretend that mechanics and gardeners and PhDs and artists can take the role of larger institutional bodies. So we're with the humor of the Zapatistas where the United Nations used to be was the name of our art space down there. And so working with political prisoner hunger strikes, 40 day hunger strikes, trying to figure out how we as visual painters can be of service, right? Um, without centering anything that we're doing, but really um, trying to be uh, a small part of a larger conversation, um, working with children crossing the Guatemala-Mexican border, thinking about uh, products carefully uh, packaged crossing international borders while the brown body um, is shifted underground for cheap labor. And so our work was really both in the center, we had former art spaces and we also worked in refugee centers. We worked with Zapatista communities. And of course, theater was a big part of our work. And within the space, uh, we work with natural builders, self-taught natural builders, uh, thinking about uh, the artistic practice who it belongs to, who's living creative lives outside of those um, categories. And they, they built this, this beautiful dome in the center of our space that, that became kind of like the mecca of, a, of our gathering spaces. And we would hold our drawing sessions, uh, anarchist uh, conferences and uh, uh, Mayan rock concerts and children's programs, university lectures. We were there for three to four years. Um, but we shortly realized that our work was really out in the communities and, and sustaining a space was, was really um, uh, a lot of work, right? As you guys can imagine. So we had residents living for six months, for six weeks, for two weeks, so three this, weeks. This one, was, uh, this one was one of my favorites. It was, um, como se llamaba, uh, program, intergalactic space program. Um, it was run by Rigo 23, he had a six month Re residency in our space and basically for six months our space turned into kind of a, a space center so artists from all over from communities um, international artists local artists um, basically everyone um, offered their craft for this kind of communal imaginative uh, space craft that would take Zapatista like inside the spaceship was, you know, like a Zapatista, a typical Zapatista community. It has the milpa, like the corn farm, the basketball court, the health clinic, the um, center of governance. And so this spaceship basically held their, their vision, their ideal, their power, their poetry, and um, went, uh, you know, throughout the world kind of sharing their ideas. And so Rigo, an artist, um, was resident for about, 20, about six months. And so he introduced us to, to Emery Douglas as he worked with political prisoners and, and, and other Black Panther Party members. And Emery Douglas is a minister of culture for the Black Panther Party, um, revolutionary artist. And, and we met with him in San Francisco. 
and we talked about a possible residency to to just think about open-endedly what can these two types of aesthetics existing in different times and spaces have to do with each other the brown indigenous struggle the black struggle um, and the resistance and the joy that comes out of these two movements and so he agreed to come and spend some time with us we raised some money through kickstarter kickstarter was pretty hot back then 2012 um and so he came and he, he, he ended up visiting about since 2012, 2016, about four to five times in different conferences and encounters in Zapatista territories. And so during this time, we're not just engaging with Zapatistas, we're engaging with artists from the EFRE, from Chile, Argentina, from, from Spain, from Paris, from France, and residents from all over. So really the project was about these kinds of engagement within, within these two movements, right? Um, and of course, we're thinking about the use of the body and visual culture between all these different sectors, right? We have the Mexican army, their use of theater, um, and the evidence of power, of course, with surveillance. And so we're looking at also um, the Black Panthers, their use of public space, their use of the body and theater to demand drastic social political change, right? And more specifically, looking at just the aesthetics of Emory Douglas and where that came from, right? Uh, the Bay Area of California. Um, and then the Zapatista, some of these murals are, um, some of the aesthetic does come from uh, some of the Chicano movements. Uh, we had a lot of Chicano artists that went after 1994 to paint a lot of these murals. And so the, the aesthetics comes from a lot of uh, resistance uh, spaces, right? Yeah, there were, I mean, what was just, you know, really interesting was seeing the overlap of these two movements and how both of them use the same tools to um, express, you know, a, a need uh, to thrive and to survive and to, you know, be uh, a self-determined um, community. Um, so kind of, you know, they, they really understood the power of art, and the power of, um, you know, and they had, they had just these certain tools within art that, um, that they used to manifest um, what they needed. Here's Emery Douglas meeting some of the Zapatistas for the first time in Oventic, the small little caracol in, uh, in north of San Cristobal de las Casas. And here's kind of like how the panther became a symbol uh, in the south, the, the crow, I mean, the, the rooster was a symbol for uh, illiterate white voters to know who to vote for. And so uh, the black community picked the panther to have that symbol for the illiterate black voter. And so the symbol became kind of a, your, your, your check mark of who, what candidate you're gonna vote for, right? And so that, that, that symbol of the panther was, was adopted from that place and time. Um, and of course, the caracol is a symbol of the Zapatista. So even that kind of contrast and comparison and, and dance of, of the caracol that carries his home wherever he goes. He goes slow, but he goes forward. Um, um, and so that, those two symbols were really beautiful marriage, if you want to say. I don't know what else, how else to to put it. And the Black Panther, uh, of course, in solidarity with a lot of movements of, of that time. Um, I think I think what's interesting is kind of the folding of time, of, of repeating time, of, of uh, those movements informing us now um, as, as something uh, where we can time travel with art and we can really exercise a living memory. And that's what the Zapatistas say, how to exercise a living memory, how to keep your memory alive. And I think this encounter tries to explore those ideas. Yeah, so we went to, you know, during the various um, times that Emery would come, we would, you know, do many different things, different communities. Um, you know, this is one of the uh, artists, some of the Zapatista artists who we worked with, who, um, you know, we kind of became family with. Um, all of the the artists would come together and you know just just to create um, a place where 
this living memory, this living imagination can exist and this um, this ability to dream and to to believe um, you know that we not only have a right to live but we have a right to to decide what our life is you know that was it was just um, it was I think it was powerful for for all of the people involved. Here we're going like Juelita, 2000, <laughs> 2013, Emery was sent by himself to about, you know, a couple of hours to the jungle. And we kind of lost touch because I was kind of held by the Zapatistas um, and uh, we split. And so he spent the two weeks out there in the community by himself with, with one, what was it, a, a 14 year old guide, a Mayan guide. And so they didn't speak Spanish, he didn't speak Mayan or, you know, and so their, their form of communication was really interesting to hear Emery talk about that experience. Um, we did gather a formal art show at our art space, gathered all this work and, and uh, residue of these experiences, uh, working with university students, university professors, as well as uh, Zapatista painters and women's embroidery collectives to come up with something. And this is where the um, interface our archive can can really talk about uh, the archiving of the image because we want to produce uh, art objects but we don't want them to be stale in that way we want them to keep bringing the memory alive right it, it, against like the, the western aesthetics of isolating an object and so we show these with altars we show them through ritual um, it's, it's still very important to have the physical presence of these objects, whether in print or in embroidery, right? Um, we share dinners around them. Uh, they become part of our, our landscape, right? Um, and the relationships that were built around the making of these objects is also very crucial to movement building, right? Uh, we know that that's when a lot of the conversations spark when we're creating posters, when we're creating um, collective uh, collaborative work. Uh, this is where a lot of these um, these shared uh, inspirational <laughs> creative movements kind of take shape and this is the time where we can also dream together. Um, here's one of the posters and really quickly some of the embroideries that were what that were some of the main work that was created was a group of uh, women embroideries from Zapatista communities took some of Emery's images and translated them into some of the iconography of the Zapatistas. Uh, this piece was a cover for Sonia Sanchez's poetry book, and they uh, they translated it into some of the some of their uh, traditional embroidery, flower making patterns for their for their dresses. This one was uh, that last one was interesting. I thought because where the tool where the tool was um, has a blank space on the right, so it's like. You know, it's very poetic the way they read it. Like, what is our tool? You know. And some of them took the shape of the uh, the newsletter, the Zapantera uh, Black Panther newsletter service, substituting the guns for the corn. Here's one of the artists. Tons of, of murals out there. So we'll just share a little bit more of the language if you go to Zapatista territory. And a lot of times we'd have to wait six, seven hours before they even let us in, showing our passports. Even if you build a relationship with them after three years, four years, the, the center of government shifts every six weeks. Um, and so you're new to them when you show up. You know, you're like, it's a whole different. Uh, time zone, time space, um, but that's part of the, the journey and the aesthetics of, of entering into their territory or entering into a different time zone. This is uh, Emery's daughter, Mericia. She came a couple times. She's a poet, activist. Um, yeah, these are just, you know, more in, in the community, um, 14 de Noviembre is the place where we did a big mural inside of the uh, auditorium where they wanted us to paint. Um, this is in the community. Sleepover. Go ahead. 
this is in the community of Moises Gandhi uh, going towards Oventic. Um, right now, there's a lot of uh, political unrest. Paramilitary groups are being armed to for the construction of the Tren Maya, the Mayan train that wishes to turn the Yucatan into some kind of Mexican Disneyland, displacing uh, a lot of folks. And so one of the stores that we painted was burned down. And so there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of current violence in a lot of these places that we that we were painting at. Um, and again, that's the, the painting, the burning of the painting. It's not really us, but it's like kind of uh, the evidence of, 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 you know, you burn the art, you burn the houses, you burn the collective tiendita uh, as a symbol of, of that kind of violence. And so we push back with uh, evidence of resistance of poetry. Um, there's a, a group of painters from Mexico City, from, from, from Chile. Gran Om is one of the art, lead artists for this piece. Rael from the time from San Francisco, he made in Emery Douglas in one of our paintings. Here's one of uh, the places we lived in uh, during La Escuelita. Um, and so, you know, the period of 2012 to 2016, there was a lot of different kinds of encounters and engagements. And I think these are better expressed through the people that were there and, and experienced it. And then we're, we're, we gather the residue, which is the images, the objects that were created. We created uh, Black Panther Zapatista dolls. Um, and of course, this, this work was, um, it had to kind of find land in certain places. And so uh, Emery and I would, would give talks at the University of San Francisco, University of New Mexico, Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland, uh, different places that we get invited to present the work because also that is part of, of keeping that memory alive. And what we're doing here as well is, is sharing to keep it moving forward and see how it transforms and grows so it's not static. And we'll get really quick to the part where, where we kind of uh, create these installations, right? These archival experiences for, for people who don't have that direct um, access to it or direct experience through the, through, uh, to the project. Some more of the, the schools that we painted. You want to talk about this installation, Mian? Um, this one was in Canada um, for an Encuentro Centro Anesthetico. And um, yeah, it was beautiful uh, because we came with a Soke artist and with Emery, and we connected with um, local, um, what do they? Uh, Local First indigenous, nation. yeah. What what are they called? First Nation um, artists in the area, and so you know we, we like to as well. I, I think it's interesting to not just look at Zapatista and Black Panther and the overlap, um, but to look at everywhere that this um, kind of these these kind of residue of of. Uh, you know, what we've created once it goes to new places, how does it connect to that place? Um, so, you know, just like we found within Zapatista and Black Panther, the, the you know, even the, the, the demandments, right? Um, they're the same all over the world. Everyone needs a house, everyone needs good food. Here they are, um, uh, land, education, um, health, food, living, work, liberty, justice, democracy, independence, culture, information, and peace. So this is the, um, the local activist and artist who brought us to a uh, sacred land that was turned into a golf course. Um, and, you know, uh, we had a nice collaboration there with her and she had tried to connect Connect in that way. This is back in um, in Chiapas in the Comparte, one of the events that they have there. Um, it's an international gathering in Zapatista territory. 
um, where they invite different artists from around the world to present their um, their poetry, their theater, their their vision, their art making um, as they form to kind of invite uh, thinkers into their space. So one of the Zapatista thoughts is that with art and sciences, um, we can have the power to change the world. So they've been, you know, using art and using science um, within their community, but also bringing in international um, artists and scientists. And just recently they've, um, you know, they just traveled to Europe um, to meet and create alliances and share share their vision. Um, and they're also going to be going to, I believe, the five continents over the next year. And these are all just, yeah, these are just continuing sharing the work different, diff in different gallery spaces, um, having different artists collaborate. This is at the, this was at the La, La Peña Cultural Center in Berkeley, Oakland, California. And so La Peña Cultural Center was founded by a lot of Chilean exiles as, after the Pinochet um, uh, in the takeover of 9-11 back then. And so landing in a space like that in the Bay Area is also really, really crucial for that kind of reliving of, of the Chilean activists and, and uh, artists uh, and exiles, uh, right? There's there's always that that beautiful connection to all these movements. Um, and again, really going back to the house, right? The the idea of home, the actual physical space of that object. And so, how do we transform? I mean, translate these two encounters into that kind of uh, symbol of a home? Um, and so, this here is at the Fresno State University. Um, this was at the middle of Standing Rock when Standing Rock was was uh, was demonstrating some beautiful beautiful resistance, right? Um, and so again, we're trying to reflect the current moment when we try to show this type of encounter so that it doesn't become stale or an object in the traditional museum sense. Um, we tilted the house so that when you enter the house, you become aware of your body, you become a little bit disoriented with the tilting of perspective. Um, becoming aware of the body within your space, I think, is also a part of, of creating new memories of sight, you know, your senses. Here's Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, some of the movements that were happening in 2016. And inside has all the different records right and so here's where you guys uh, can help us articulate the importance of archiving these movements and sharing them and distributing them and publishing them um, some recreations of old murals that were painted in zapatista territory we have some dolls we contacted some of the lead photographers back of the black panther party to uh, share with us their their documentation of the movement there's a little Black Panther doll. We also worked with an artist of Afro-Mexican descent uh, to bring in the invisibility or the visibility of the Afro-Mexican, right? And so there's just so many different beautiful connections that you could see in each one of these objects. A Chilean friend. And I think we can, um, I think we're kind of short on time. I mean, kind of running and we can just Go through the slides and answer questions as we go along. We have we don't have too many left. Thank you so much, Mia and Caleb. Um, what we had prepared was um, uh, Shruti had prepared a few questions to kind of like ease us into an open conversation. Um, so um, I will hand it off. And also, if folks have um, questions, they can type them directly into the chat. Um, while this is happening, so everyone get your um, your mind, uh, your brain flowing, um, and um, or put a little um, like icon up on your um, <clears throat> um, how do you do that? Now I forgot. Um, basically, type in the chat that you have a question if you want to ask it out loud, or you can type it directly into the chat, and we will um, call on you um, and give you the floor. So Shruti. 
Yeah. Um, while we're looking at all of this incredible embroidery embroidery work, um, I think what's been exciting about specifically the intersections that I think with Kaleb and Mia, your approach to this work um, is that it really is not just um, keeping a memory alive by remembering it in its original place, but actually reactivating that memory and co co-creating that memory's place in every single person's life. Um, and I think that to your last question about, you know, the importance of archival practices and the way that we specifically at Interference approach archiving is really all about materials that are made stronger and more like they're meant to be when they're shared and reflected, by, re reflected on by as many people as possible. And I think that's something that I, I think about a lot of, um, when I'm thinking about craft practices too, especially when we think about, you know, Emery's original work and the kind of like the, the guerrilla nature of their um, printmaking and the communications of the Black Panther Party. And then also thinking about Zapatistas and their work with, um, you know, different forms of craft. Um, and then with y'all now thinking about embroidery, I'm curious if, you know, there are any thoughts you have on the different craft traditions and how they, um, have strengthened your personal ability or understanding of, of different change movements and solidarities? Sure, um, craft, I mean, uh, we were working with uh, Mexico City, uh, you know, printmakers and then uh, the Zapatistas that do the handkerchiefs. And so uniting those two things, so the, the handkerchief uh, narratives are, are really current, you know. Um, first it was the video camera and then now it's uh, the phone, you know, and so the, the Zapatista women embroideries that when they tell the story of resistance in the handkerchiefs, they're very current in their language, right? They're not getting stuck on this, this romantic notion of, a, of what it is to do indigenous embroidery work because it's really about the storytelling that they, that they, um, that they employ, right? Um, Mia, you want to talk about the piece you guys did in, in, for for the Cuba show, or uh, no? I think um, I think what I would just add on to what you were saying is, you know, within craft, I think there's um, there's a potential for some sort of, um, you know, for lack of better words, like kind of shamanistic. Um, approach to, to, to using materials, right? So um, a, a simple object or, or a, an embroidery um, has, has a life within it, right? That can, that can be like a, a shape shifter to the people who use it or to the people who wear it or the people who create it. So, you know, an embroidery is not just a place for us to pass stories on from from the past to the future it's not only a place to to create you know um clothes for our bodies or to you know talk about the iphone versus the camera and like the technology that's progressing um you know it's there there's something in there that that is that is magical in a sense or that is uh capable of of transforming life Yes, I hear all of that. I think, Caleb, you said uh, it's evidence of resistance and also poetry earlier when you were talking about all of these. And I, I think that that's another thing that when I think about Zapatistas and the show that um, Elena and I and other folks at the archive helped put together, um, one of the things we thought about was um, how they occupied different um, state spaces and institutional spaces with you know paper planes and now when they're in Europe using paper boats and how that has really transformed maybe the understanding of what quote unquote like craft as a uh, a practice is when it's uh, perfected versus craft as an accessible medium for a lot of different generations to engage. Um, and I think that's also similar to when we saw that embroidery where um, the the gun was replaced with uh, like a, a white space, right? Kind of leaving it open for us to imagine what could be the the ways in which we um, protect ourselves um, militantly and with a, a commitment to creativity. I'm wondering if you know with the all of these languages that are talking about both um, institutional resources and 
institutional spaces and reclaiming them in each of the places that y'all are in now, how do you how do you think of rec reclamation and uh, resistance to institutionality? Um, I could go back to to this piece. Uh, this was in, in Vienna, Austria, and so talking about institutions and um, the grasp of of institutional spaces and white spaces um, and being invited to places like this and, and the conflict of participating in shows like this. Um, but uh, the curator uh, and the, the work and, and, and uh, the research and the care given to these types of shows that are kind of infiltrating these spaces is, is where this work should, should also ultimately be. Of course, with the permission of the community, we asked permission and and they uh, are the masters of storytelling, and uh, and so they were encouraging this type, this type of work to be exhibited. Also, we were waiting for the tapatistas to show up to um, to France um, during the global pandemic, um, and so we were responding to that through, with this installation. Here we are in Paris. Um, when they finally made it, we were waiting. Um, and we did a, a, a small little pop-up show with a different artists from all over the place, right? And we did this little tiny house with found materials with some local collectives. And so I guess that existing um, with the institutional language and with the grassroots organizers um, kind of uh, lends to this kind of uh, aesthetic and I don't know, honesty and vulnerability and uh, you know? I mean, I also think, you know, it's not only taking over these spaces that you just mentioned, but, you know, if you look at both of the movements, they're taking over public space um, and they're reclaiming land um, and they're using their bodies to do so in a, you know, in a way that, you know, in solidarity with, with the whole community. So I mean, you know, I still think that's just as important as it was, you know, back when the Black Panther movement was active, you know, it's still still happening in Chiapas, it's still happening, you know, with Black Lives Matter, it's still happening with movements all around the world. And it's, you know, it's important that we continue to um, to reclaim space. Um, I wanted to invite um, Tanya. Um, it, you had said in the chat that you had a question. Thank you. Yeah, I um, because we the the discussion about the archive is something that I've been grappling with myself, um, and I thought since we are all thinking about it, maybe it'll be interesting to hear what you think as well. Um, yeah, I, in my practice, I've been creating an archive in Peru, but I've also been in conversation with collectives in South America, um, especially like performance artists, one in particular, it's Cetera from Argentina, and they have a pretty robust archive of their practices since the 1990s. And the conversation that, that, I've, um, that I've had with them about having a collection of your art is where does the archive live? What are you really calling an archive? What is in the archive? Um, and also how do we manage extractivism from any sort of institution or place in the North that would take away the objects out of their context so that it's more available for more privileged um, people and, and make it harder for those who come from the actual context to study or to, in, to interact with. So I'm wondering if these are things that you are also grappling with and if, where you imagine this archive would live, even though like it's amazing that you imagine it traveling and engaging with different groups. But if these are things that you have been thinking about where it might live, where it should belong, where it, it's like the context is the strongest to tell the story that, uh, that, that this cultural production tells. 
um, yeah, and if these are things that, that you have been thinking about, I would love to hear some of that as well. Sure, yeah, that's always a great, um, interesting way to frame artistic practices. Um, the thing is that it's, uh, if, if you think, if we think about it as an ecosystem, um, that we are just a, a small part of a larger ecosystem of folks, really powerful, talented folks that are working as, as historians, as curators, as journalists, as lawyers, um, as visual artists, you know, as, as cultural movers and educators. I think if we think about the movement like that, we, we might open ourselves a little bit more to the possibilities of shifting the institutional and violent practices of these spaces that we talk about that, that represent power, right? If these places represent power, is it possible to create an allyship within those spaces? Of course, probably not, right? Um, but if, if we think about it as an ecosystem, of, of different uh, talents working within different spaces. I can't go into those spaces with, with my talents. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll freeze if I'm confronted within these systems of institutional power, but I can work in communities. I can work in refugee centers. That's, that's where my language is at. That's where my comfort zone is at. That's where my body's at. Other people um, might feel empowered to work within these spaces. And so I think if we look at ourselves as, as a small part of this larger movement to shift the narrative, the violent narrative of a capitalist system that has such a strong grasp on us, um, I think we, we kind of can imagine of, of shifting those, those paradigms. That's the way I think the Zapatistas have taught me uh, to, to flip it upside down and to always, you know, move forward without not near, really knowing where we're going but having faith and trust in, in, in the magic of the cosmos. <laughs> I don't know if that kind of um, worked a little bit and oh, no. no, I was just wondering where you like you were talking about an archive and I really don't know now what you mean by archive if you're using it in this like ambiguation of an archive or if it's an actual physical place where you're keeping things um, like interference archive let's say, like an actual physical space where things can be found and come to be studied and interacted with. And if, if that's a place that you're imagining having with the production, the cultural production you've been creating with these groups, or if it's um, not, not really put in that way and what maybe you meant by archives then. Yeah, I, I misunderstood. I, when, when the museums function, they function as historical archive spaces, right? And then you, and then you mentioned something about accessibility. Who is it accessible for? Is, is it, uh, um, and so I, I kind of went into those systems of power rather than, than what the archive is actually doing. So yeah, I totally missed that one. Do <laughs> um, you wanna take this? I don't know. I feel I feel like uh, people from the archives could actually answer this question better. I feel like for us, um, what we've been doing the past few years seems to be more of a nomadic kind of archive. So you know, it's um, typically been housed within this Zapatista style home, um, and it you know is positioned in a way that relates to the body and it has all of these kind of um, archival pieces that have been created uh, during the duration of the project and within its showing in places, it interacts with the place that it goes to through um, artists or activists or whoever is in that place, you know, they also um, kind of add their own, um, you know, collaboration to the piece. Um, so in that way, it seems to be, you know, kind of like a nomadic living archive, you could say. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, it's, you know, life and art is, is the thing that's always 
transforming and always kind of like always changing right like you have to kind of follow the heart and the, the heart the, like this collective heart to see what makes it feel most alive and what makes it you know have a voice and how does it connect to the people how does it connect to the land um i think when you follow those kind of those signs you, you kind of discover like you know within your work like what what makes the most sense as a how this archive should live right and i think mia and Caleb, what you guys were saying about um I think the the physical aspects of the archive is is just one aspect of it and like the pictures of y'all cooking and being with different community members is like that to me has always felt like a a larger part of the archive um I come from my or my folks come from South India and so like the tradition of archiving there is normally oral histories or like sharing knowledge that is then embodied um and then learned like that, learned by living with someone, learned by being in community with someone. And that feels like a form of archival knowledge that is both anti-institutional and place-based and person-based um, and can be institutional too when it needs or needs to be so that it can be made accessible, right? And I think it's been exciting to hear from y'all Caleb and Mia to um, see just how like strong a tradition that is of resistance, um, yeah. I don't know, Tanya, if that is, yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to hear how you are all thinking about archive. When you say archive, what do you mean? How do you manage it? How do you imagine it? Because it's something I, I just have been having this conversation with some collectives in, in South America. And, and apparently this conversation has been happening since the 1990s and I'm arriving already pretty late. And so I just uh, heard that and I wanted to hear what you were thinking. But thank you. And if you'd be down, Tanya, we can connect you with our curator and the archivist who brought his collection up from Mexico City, because I know he has a lot of thoughts about even what it means to bring that out of, you know, Mexico City rather than from Chiapas. So if you'd be yeah. down. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and I, just to add to that too, one other big part of the show um, with the curator that we worked with, Eden, um, was to have his collection and materials that he's been collecting, you know, as he grew up over the years, um, um, in direct conversation with another archive, which is why he kind of like came to interference um, and wanted to kind of share where his the the materials that he has um, can be in conversation with the kinds of materials that made its way to New York, because um, interference archive um, collection is donation based, um, so there's often like a lot of really interesting stories about why folks. Um, held on to materials that they've acquired. Most of them, like many people are parts of movements and that's why they had these collections and gave them to the archive. Um, so I think I think there's something to kind of keep teasing out and talking about like what that means to have that like the, the archives in direct conversation. And maybe this is also a nice moment to share that um, Caleb and Mia and Shruti and I have been talking about um, printing images of some of the embroidery works and bringing them to interference to be part of the um, collection um, and possibly other collections as well. I think it's a really great way of us continuing that like um, itinerant uh, creating cycle, right? Because this was Emery's piece originally and then embroidered and now printed again. I think it's a really exciting um, artifact of ancestry across movements. Any other questions or comments? Daniel, please. Um, you can, if you want to type or unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, it's a really great discussion. And Tanya, I think the, the question is a quite relevant one. And uh, first, thank you both for the, the presentation, really empowering and inspiring. And I'm, I'm talking as the, the founder of an artist collective out of Lebanon, and uh, Jamal Yed is our name. And our idea of the collective, this is touching back on what you were saying, Suruti, which is 
it's not a physical place as much as it's held within the knowledge of everyone who's connected and networked and those networks are constantly revived. So for example, when we were asked to curate uh, an exhibition at the UNESCO Palace in Beirut for of Palestinian posters, we didn't go to the American University Library. We didn't go to any notion of, of a physical place. We put out a call to all of our networks and stuff started coming in and it meant visiting bookstore basements and it meant you know, going to the Palestinian embassy and it meant you know, pulling together uh, images and work from a lot of different places. And even in the States, I'm working on a project with some colleagues uh, in, in the Interior Valley of California. We know there's no place to go for relevant images of say the labor movements that were going taking place and Cesar Chavez and, and other things like that. But we're confident that when the call goes out, these materials will come together and they exist in that kind of non-space. I don't know what to refer to it as, but it's known, it's understood. And um, yeah, I think the word, our word archive or the English term archive brings up images of dusty boxes and basements and that kind of thing. And maybe getting away from that a little bit and thinking of it more as a manifestation of collective will um, might be one way to look at it. But I, I'm appreciating this conversation because I think it's something, uh, especially when you're working with material which is resistant in nature and were it to find a physical space can often be targeted and destroyed, um, that, it, that it live in a kind of uh, collective ownership is something to, to really give thought to. So thanks for letting me ramble on about that for a couple of minutes. Yeah, I think, Daniel, what you're saying is really, really resonating with me, especially because when you're talking about also those networks, um, institutions or the places that maybe have knowledge or artifacts tend to choose certain types of artifacts. Um, and here we can really make sure that it's it's the people's voices and that, I mean, was the goal of Emory Douglas of the Black Panther Party of the Zapatistas and like, I mean, every social movement that we all care yeah. for. And, as, and especially with, with Emory Douglas, when you think that now a lot of his work is being collected into uh, books of graphic design, with, you know, now that, I don't like to say it this way, now that the dominant culture sees the movement as in the historical past, it's now safe to compile it all together and admire the aesthetics of it as opposed to understanding the power of it. So keeping, keeping our uh, resistant energies and our cultural production activated, I think also becomes something that's really crucial. So thanks. Any other? Um... Final uh, comments or questions? Okay, great. Um, well, everyone, thank you so much. This was a really interesting conversation and I'm excited to um, continue it um, uh, as we move on in <laughs> tonight and into other spaces um, and um, Thank you, Caleb and Mia, so much for being on the call and joining us and um, for all the fabulous ideas and um, work and images and memories that you shared. Um, and Shruti, do you have anything you want to add? Nothing. I'm just putting some links. Oh, gosh. I'll okay. do a better version of this, but put some links in the chat for y'all. Um, thank you again, Caleb and Mia. Um, All right, thanks a lot. I'll just finish with this quick little video. Audio in it. You guys get that?
I looked at the books puzzled. Surprised me, brother, I said. I thought you were going to honor me and go. I just did. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was really a pleasure, pleasure um, speaking about this stuff. Like archival stuff's really expanding my mind to hear about what what the purpose is of this this record. So thanks again. Thank you, folks. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you. Take care.